Good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Oscar Sinclair and the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. It is a pleasure to welcome the Reverend Catherine Clarenbach to this conversation. Um, Catherine is one of my Unitarian Universalist colleagues. We met at Wesley Theological Seminary a couple years ago, which we'll talk about as part of this conversation. Reverend Catherine is also, as it happens, an initiate of uh, the tradition of Stone Circle Wicca and identifies as a UU pagan. She runs the online community, The Way of the River, and much of her work can be found at thewayoftheriver.com and on Facebook at The Way of the River Community Group. And I'm looking at my script because I want to make sure that I get those, those names and links right. They'll also be in the description of this video. So if, if you're interested in learning more about Reverend Catherine's work, um, you'll be able to, to go straight to it and, and read it. Um, I can say I've been on the, the Way of the River mailing list since a long time now. <laughs> Four or five years at least, I think. Yeah. Uh, and I, I look forward to the, the reflections that I get in my mailbox um, every time they come in. Uh, I read them the same. Most way. Mondays. Yep. Yep. Um, so, my dear friend. <laughs> Indeed. Um, I guess the question that was not on, on the script, but, but uh, I usually start with is, how are things with your soul right now? Oh, my goodness. You know, I had a, a person, I, one of the things I do is offer spiritual accompaniment or spiritual direction. And I had a client recently say, I feel bad because things are going really well with me. Mm -hmm. Things are well with my soul. And we had this whole conversation about guilt in a time of pandemic. And I share some of that feeling because I am still being able to meet with my wonderful people. I still am able to, you know, enjoy and stretch and blossom into my ministry um, in ways that are truly satisfying and I've been working from home and working online for years right so I haven't had the the loss of employment or the um, tremendous shift in in work environment that so many people have and I don't have to do my work and mind children at the same time <laughs> which I know many folks are doing now and some of them are single parents and to them especially my heart goes out but my soul is serene my soul is serene Good. and I hear um, so you live in Portland Oregon and I hear I the flowers are blooming in your front yard they are oh my goodness yes yes we have a sort of medium to dark pink dogwood and uh, a lilac that are my backdrop, um, or not my backdrop, but my foredrop, I suppose. Um, so I see my house plants framed by the dogwood and the lilac, both of which are blooming. Mm. Mm. So as we were talking in preparation for this time, you mentioned that um, you had a, a spiritual experience recently. Um, and before we, we dive into what that experience was, I, I wonder if we might just spend a little bit of time talking about what, what you mean when you say religious experience. What mm -hmm. is that to you as a, as a concept? Well, I, I do want to note that you translated and said it was a religious experience. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Which is interesting okay. and important. Oh. No, it's an, it's an important question because in this case, it was not in the context of um, our shared faith or in my um, tradition of Stone Circle Wicca. It wasn't bounded um, in that way. I actually was part of a meditative experience that was offered by my business community, Heart of Business, which is uh, was founded by a couple who are um, of the Sufi tradition. Okay. Um, Mark Silver and Holly Glazer. And Holly offers 
um, what she calls a deep dive heart meditation twice a month. Excuse me, twice a month. And because we constantly are saying in that community, what does your heart tell you? Mm -hmm. How are you relating to the source of love such that your heart can receive guidance from that which is larger than yourself? And, and Holly's point has been, but what does that mean? Like, <laughs> how do you access to your heart? Like, what is that even about? So she, you know, and Mark was sort of chagrined, right? Because he says it all the time. You know, ask your heart, ask your heart, ask your heart. And Molly, or Molly, Holly pointed out, I think we need some practice. Mm -hmm. And this was my third of her deep dive meditative calls. They last about an hour. And in this call, we do uh, a practice of breathing to deepen our state of meditation um, and to bring, if we have one, a question regarding our ministries, our businesses, our lives, our hearts, our relationships, whatever we have, to our hearts where we experience ourselves and the divine as inextricable. Mm -hmm. um, my first spiritual director, Sister Paula Drass of the Sisters of St. Joseph, um, told me that she knew that her prayer was in a good place when she couldn't tell where she ended and God began. Mm -hmm. And I felt that experience in that meditation that I was in union with the sources of life in the universe, the, the spirit of life, as we would say, often in Unitarian Universalism, and the wellspring of love. Mm -hmm. And in that experience, I was given slash uncovered, <laughs> um, depending on your point of view, um, the words withhold nothing, mm. withhold nothing. And I have been meditating on them for the last several days and thinking about how that's not the same thing as give everything, right? Withhold nothing is not the same thing as sell all your goods and give them the money away. But it is it is kind of a trick question, though, because what is ours? What do I truly have that is mine, mm -hmm. which is nothing? Nothing that we have has been brought into being solely by our own effort. Um, our bodies, our lives, our interactions, the way we think, our possessions, our money, all these things come about because of what some Buddhists call the 10,000 things, which are the innumerable blessing powers of the universe coming together in a specific way to lead to us and who we are and how we are in the world. And so withhold nothing seems to me to be an admonition to remember where my stuff comes from, which is for me um, from the divine spirit of the universe and not to try to keep it for myself that I was put here in this state the recycled materials of the universe came together to make Catherine Clarenbach in part so that I could reveal what many people don't reveal. I talk about being a person with mental illness. I talk about what it's like to be a fat minister. I talk about what it's like to be a queer femme in um, spiritual leadership. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I, I have a history of not withholding things that people um, often would not reveal or not talk about. Mm 
-hmm. And of course, within our professional boundaries, we need to be careful about how we speak about our lives. But this experience of just two words brought out of this very deep place in my heart, withhold nothing, was an admonition to me to be more of my own best self. So that's that's what that was about for me. It sounds like an amazing experience. It really was. And I came out of it totally speechless. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I um I don't know if this resonates at all all with you, but I get the sense sometimes that that uh, that we are thought as clergy that we are constantly having those experiences. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> and and in in truth i've had you know maybe five or six of them in my life well and so, Teresa of calcutta is said to have had one right and and even one is is earth shaking and changes the direction of a life mm-hmm. um and and mm-hmm. uh i don't know that's that, I, I often wonder that, like, mostly my, my days, day to day, are are pretty mundane. And then every once in a while, there's this shining connection with something deeper or greater or wh- however, however it fits in your theology. Yeah. Uh, or, or that is just unnameable is, is the closest my theology gets to it, is, is that, you know, what is what is unknown is is divine or or what is divine is is unknowable unknowable yeah ineffable totality numinous yep well and there is this element i'll just mention which is that um before i was treated with bipolar disorder the world sometimes was full of delights and glitter and, you know, impossible beauty all the time, Mm -hmm. except when it was completely bleak and horrid and awful. And, you know, so there is a sense in me almost of relief that I can have genuine connection and be well. Yeah. Yeah. And be well. So what's changed for you since that experience? Well, I think, I think, as I said, it is a reminder to me to be brave, Mm -hmm. to be of good heart, especially in these times of pandemic, to offer, you know, many of my clients are our colleagues. Right. Um, Many of the people who work with me are helping other people. Um, There are members of the Way of the River Facebook community group whom you've seen who, you know, there's one who works in an ER. I have a friend who's a social worker in a hospital. I have another friend who's a doctor working in a hospital um, um, and now working particularly with patients with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. and I owe it to the people with whom I live and serve even over miles and miles and by pixelated connection not to keep myself back when they're giving so much of themselves Mm. so it was a reminder just to not to be afraid of what people will think or of the consequences of my simply telling the truth, which is what I try to do is to speak the truth in love Mm -hmm. in my work Mm -hmm. and to listen. I'm I'm just I'm thinking about the combination of those two things that you just said to speak the truth in love and to listen. Mm. To do them both at the same time. 
Um, yeah. It's a remarkable balance to hold some days. Mm-hmm. So you and I met uh, years ago now, almost a decade ago. You said a couple of years ago, and I was like, okay, Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I had a hair then. <laughs> some some hair. Um uh but we we met at a um religious education class as I remember right at at Wesley. Mm-hmm. Um and uh and we did the best final project ever. We did. That- done in a UU religious education class. May I just say friends who are listening, look out for the year long, <laughs> lifelong religious education course that is that is mulling about in your minister's brain to this day. I'm telling you, oh, it's my, coming for you. My brain <laughs> mm. um. <laughs> yes. Uh, if anybody from the Green Sanctuary Committee listening, that was in fact a, a year long project that involved uh, ecology and justice. Yeah. Um, but um, one of the things uh, I wonder if we can talk about, because it's one of the things that I, I learned from you at Wesley, is, is what it meant to be, uh, to be somebody who was not identifying as Christian at a very Christian seminary. And, yeah. And, um, and just what it was like to, to swim in, in the waters of that particular place. Um, so I wonder, you know, now that, now that a decade has gone by, <laughs> If you have any reflections on on what that place has meant or 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 means, I find that it means some of everything I hoped for it to mean, and some things I couldn't have anticipated. Um, I went to Wesley in part because I lived in the D.C. area; it was accessible to me. But I had looked at other seminaries, including Star King and Meadville Lombard Seminary School of Ministry. No. Anyway, Star King and Meadville Lombard are UU um, theological schools and, and other seminaries as well. And yet I decided that a Protestant seminary, a mainline Protestant seminary was going to give me a better education than seminaries that were already coming from angles I had inhabited and understood more of. I was raised Roman Catholic and I was very, very devout. I can tell you all about all kinds of saints. For example, uh, Saint Peregrine, is the um, saint of uh, of severe illness. So think of St. Peregrine. Um, uh, there's another saint who's knocking on my door and I can't think of who it is. Anyway, um, I was raised Roman Catholic. I was very devout. I still have a particular devotion to Mary actually. And I knew nothing about sort of mainline Protestant Christianity. Evangelical Christianity was loud and noisy and politically involved, you know, throughout the 80s when I was younger. Um, Jerry Falwell was coming up Mm -hmm. and Pat Robertson was in his height. But I didn't know anything really about like, what does it mean to be a Presbyterian or a Methodist? Or um, I knew a little bit about Episcopalians, but and I grew up in a lily white town, right? And I wanted to go to a place that would help me engage in larger political discourse in our nation. Um, and where I would meet people who were really different from myself and who were different on 
in, in different ways. So one of the interesting things about Wesley is that because it has night and weekend classes, as well as day classes and online classes, even before um, our current circumstances, it has a greater socioeconomic um, range than many seminaries do. It also has a large Korean and Korean American population and a substantial population of African American um, and other Black American folks, as well as many white students. Um, it's half Methodists of one kind or another and half all kinds of other people. Um, and there was this cohort of about 10 UUs total um, when I when I first went there in 2010. Yep. Um, and I had a conversation, just as an example. One of our colleagues, um, who I won't name because it could be damaging to him for me to name him, is a Black Baptist pastor, a brilliant reader of the Bible in a frame that is very different from the way I read the Bible. Sure. And he said to me, I'd like to have a phone conversation with you. And I said, well, we could have lunch <laughs> in the refectory. And he said, well, I need to have a phone conversation with you. And I said, okay, sure, fine. And we got on the phone and he said, it's very important for me to listen to you in this, in this conversation because I know that you are a woman of God and that I need to hear what you have to say. And I'm thinking, where is this going? What is happening? And he proceeds to ask me how I can reconcile my life as a woman married to another woman with my understanding of biblical injunctions regarding homosexuality. And he's asking me because, I quote, I need to pastor to all my people, not just the ones I can make assumptions about. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, and remind me if I interrupt you that I need to listen to you. That is not a conversation that would have happened at Starking. Right? That's no. not. No. Right? It, 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 it just wouldn't. And my best friend from seminary, with all due respect to my beloved colleague, Oscar, um, is an American Black Baptist um, with whom I speak almost every day. And um, we have influenced one another's lives tremendously. You know, I have friends from there who are um, Methodists and Presbyterians and um, uh, Methodist Episcopal um, and uh, Christian Methodist Episcopal. I mean, all kinds of denominations. There was a woman who was there when I was there who began her studies as a Messianic Jew, which was something I was extremely extremely uncomfortable with, even though it wasn't any of my business, but came out of seminary a Methodist. So, you know, <laughs> um, it was just really important to me to, if I was going to be a bridge, if I was going to be somebody who, as the Sisters of St. Joseph taught me, enlarges the circle of compassion always so that no one is left out. Mm -hmm. Then I needed to talk to people who I didn't assume were just like me or would understand me. One of, one of the parts of that story that, that's really striking to me is, is, the, is early on, you said that, that he said, I, I know I need to listen to you because you are a, a, a woman of God. Yeah. 
I, I think often I've reflected on that because I, I remember like smack on day one of, of Wesley getting told by folks at orientation that we were all here because we were, we were called by the divine and we used different theological language to, to come up with that. But, but what we were not going to do <laughs> was question each other's calls. Um, mm. And, and I wonder about that as sort of a, a base assumption that allows more dialogue to happen. Yeah. Like if, if, I didn't get that message on day one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so it for but sure. it was, um, but it, I mean, I, I also had the conversation with a lifelong Methodist who, upon hearing my extremely checkered religious history said, well, how do you know you want to be a UU minister? Yeah. If you've been all these things, I said, sweetheart, she was much, much younger than I. I said, you've only ever been Methodist. How do you know that you want to be a Methodist minister? So we did question each other's calls in that moment, not in a way of saying, I don't believe you have one. Right. You know, but to to seriously inquire with one another, like, I asked my covenant discipleship group, which were small, like small group ministry groups for our audience, um, sort of. I asked them, I said, what does this mean Jesus saves us from death? What I, and I never got a satisfactory answer, just for the record. <laughs> I never got a satisfactory answer. For me, the answers yeah. were never satisfactory. Yep. Yep. Because it seems to me that people die. It, it that does seem apparent. <laughs> um, yes. 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 Yeah, I remember my covenant discipleship group, which if you've been watching a couple of these, was the small group that Kara Rockhill and I were in together. <laughs> um, struggled uh, when we were writing our covenant um, uh, because for some folks it was imperative that in order to have a covenant we needed, the covenant needed to be biblical. Mm. And for some of the rest of us, me, um, some of the early proposals for what scripture we would base our covenant on were um, mm. just not going to work. Uh, well, and there was a, a class, a group, to which the the gentleman with, with whom I had that phone conversation belonged that was based on, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to the Father is through me. Yep. Yep. And that was very, very important to them. It was their founding scripture. Yeah. And I was always like, hmm, what do I think about that? What does it mean to be only through someone? <laughs> you know, so anyway, yeah. well, I didn't so, mean to interrupt. No, no, ours, ours ended up, um, and, and it wasn't my suggestion. It came out of somebody, uh, one of the more conservative members in the group. It was, um, it was Micah 6. Oh, nice. You know, what is it that, that the Lord asks of you, but to, um, oh, help. Um, walk humbly. Walk humbly. Do justice. And love mercy. And love mercy. We're messing it up. But that's yeah. okay. It's kind of a good sign. You know, it was, it was, <laughs> it was my ordination verse as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Love mercy, do justice, and walk humbly with there your God. Go. Yes, it ends with walk humbly. Walk that's humbly fun. with your God, yeah. Um. Yes. And, and yeah. Well, and it's so interesting, right? Like our ordinations, both of us were grounded in biblical texts. It was because yours was the burning bush. Mine was the burning bush. Mine was the Exodus three. Right. And I think that's significant, right? I'm, I wouldn't have done that before I went to Wesley. I wouldn't have made that choice. Right. Oh, I remember Rob Hardy's preached uh, a sermon on on fire but not consumed. Be be on a flame but not consumed. Yeah, which is a message that many of us need to hear. Many of us who are inclined to overwork and overcommitment, that we are a flame and consumed. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> somewhere, maybe not in a live taping, there's a fascinating conversation or article or sermon about the interaction between that and withhold nothing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But remember, it doesn't mean give everything away. Right. Right. That, that's the thing. Right. That's the thing. Maybe I'll do my coffee time on the Way of the River community Facebook group about yeah. it. <laughs> and that you all who are Facebook folks can come and see. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the Way of the River a little sure. bit. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges for, for a lot of us in the last couple of months, and I'll, I'll speak for myself, um, mm. is getting really used to one way of, of being in religious community. Yes. Of meeting once a week or twice a week, um, singing songs together, mm. um, you know, having coffee hour, which is, I, I know at least in Nebraska, coffee hour, if not sacramental, is, is an ordinance. It's... <laughs> Um, it's part of the community life to, to, to gather and to, to mingle. Um, and it's been very strange to move into this new space of, of breakout groups. Yeah. <laughs> right? Breakout like... groups and zoom and live chats on YouTube and, and we're doing it. Um, but, uh, one of my favorite classes at Wesley was a, a class on the Psalms. So Psalm 137 says, how shall we sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? That, you know, how, when we are in exile, do we, um, do we do the things that have brought us spiritual meaning? How do we adapt them from one to the other? In, in the Psalm, how do we sing them when we're in exile and when our harps are hung up on that tree over there and we can't play them? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and it's particularly poignant because unless you have, there is now a program, if people are close enough together and may work in congregations, I don't know, one would have to ask Kimberly, whom you've also interviewed. Yes. Um, She's the affiliate minister in Lincoln, actually. Oh, indeed. I had no idea. Yep. How fun. Whoa, lucky you. Right. <laughs> um there's a program that will allow better singing together on zoom. It's called jazz something, but it relies somewhat on distance, mm -hmm. physical distance. So for example, when I have um, ceremonies or other events where we would love to sing together, you can't, really do that on regular zoom because it's a cacophony and everybody it sounds terrible um and there are ways to manage it right there there are ways to around that but how do we sing our songs is a real question yeah um but more broadly and more you know sort of metaphorically like how do we how do we come together um in communion with one another in a religious context that is new. And one of the ways is to be, to seek resilience and courage and an innovative, flexible spirit. We must be supple beings who are willing to be surprised willing for that connection that lives between us and beyond us to be possible. If we don't think it's possible to come through pixels and across miles, it won't. It can't. Right. Because it cannot penetrate our own insistence on disbelief, which could be related to other things too, but you know. <laughs> um, so that's the first thing, right? Is right. is be open, and um, and consider this time of religious community a time of an invitation to innovation. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I mean, Middle Collegiate Church has been live streaming, or they're just Middle Church now, I think, in New York City, has been live streaming their uh, services for a long time. They're amazing. And I always feel um, uplifted. Of course, CLF, right? The Church of the Larger Fellowship in our UU context has been doing work online for years and years. So there are people, and Kimberly is another one, to whom we can go, right? There are people to whom we can go and ask and, and say, how do you bring the spirit through the interwebs. Well, so, so, my dear friend, you are one of the people that has been doing this for a while. Mm -hmm. And, and so I guess my, my question to you is how, how do you, how do you bring the spirit through the interwebs? Because it, one of the things for me that makes it easier to innovate, like, like you were saying, is knowing that it's been done. Like I, I know, mm. I know that you, you have been doing this and doing this well for years. Um, and, and so for me, that, that's, that's proof that, that this distance of, of pixels and miles is, does not need to be a barrier to authentic spiritual mm -hmm. life. Well, interestingly, I would have to say part of where I learned how to do this was in a largely pagan interfaith community in Southern Pennsylvania, where we made religious community and religious ceremony outside in an enormous space. It was about the size of a soccer pitch. And there was, there was no amplification. It was almost always multi-generational. And it was embodied, my, in my tradition we talk about, because we have a couple of people who love long words, um, needs-based that are, that are shared rituals need to be based in the needs of individuals, communities, and um, devotion to the turning of the year. Mm -hmm. Needs-based, psycho-emotive, transformative ritual. If we cannot reach the minds and hearts of one another, why are we doing this anyway? Mm -hmm. So I learned in that context how to bring it, right? You have to really bring it. If you're going to do this for 400 people standing in two circles outside, and the same thing strangely applies online. Mm -hmm. Religious leaders, worship leaders, um, folks who are singing need to bring a presence of attention and, and have their own spiritual house in order. Mm -hmm. Even more, I think, than in person in some ways, because you're reaching. Mm -hmm. There's always a sense of reaching because you are alone in your study right now, and I am alone in mine with my banana plant. Um, and yet we are together in, in some way. Mm -hmm. But you have to be willing again it's that willingness to trust oh good lord i'm gonna sound like i'm in formation in uh in uh coming up in uu ministry but to trust the process to take a leap you know every time every time i write reflections i think does anyone need to hear this just as we do when we write sermons Mm -hmm. Does anyone need to hear this besides me, the one who wrote it? We ask ourselves those questions and we do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's true online too. We, we stumble. Some things don't work. There are always bumps. 
but there are always bumps in in person worship too right someone mm -hmm. forgets that spirit of life happens after the offertory whatever and skips it accidentally and you say i noticed that we haven't sung spirit of life let's do that <laughs> Right? It just happens. And it's the same thing online. It's the same. Uh, yeah. That's been an interesting, um, as I'm, as I'm thinking about it, that's been an interesting thing for me because in person, I actually, I love those moments of sort of improvisational ministry when the order of service has gone completely off the wall and, <laughs> You know, you just, my congregation has heard this story a lot, but I, I visited a, um, a church in downtown Asheville, North Carolina once yeah. um, that, that was um, mostly a food, food bank and um, uh, a place for, for folks to come and eat meals. And they had services a couple nights a week upstairs. Um, and, uh, and you walk in and you get handed the order of service. And on the top of the order of service, it says, the order of service may be blown away at any time by the spirit. <laughs> Beautiful. The spirit will blow where it will. I, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I must have used that at least once every other month when <laughs> some bonkers thing would happen in, in the building. And yeah, no, it's, it's what you do, but it's uh, for, for me, at least it's a steeper learning curve, not to get flustered. Mm. Um, mm hmm in online service so the other night um we were doing one of these thursday night services and and unlike sunday which is relatively highly produced there are four or five of us on the call there's this one person doing tech there's me talking mm -hmm. um thursday night is just me like sitting in this chair and so i'm pulling up stuff on this screen to share while i'm talking to people here um and uh and something something went wrong and um and I was like, all right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll recover from that. And then I, I eventually got it shared. And then I thought, oh, there, there'll be this funny thing where when people come back, I'll share my screen of this meme that I saw online, which is Bones McCoy from Star Trek saying, damn it, Jim, I'm a pastor, not a videographer. <laughs> um, but what I had not realized is I had shared my whole screen. So what the congregation actually saw instead of the music video that was supposed to be playing was their minister typing into Google, damn it, Jim. Beautiful. <laughs> um, you know, and we came, we came back from it and it was, it was fine and it was good. And, and, and certainly there are moments of humor in just about every service, but um, it did feel harder for me to get from there back to an authentically like thoughtful worshipful moment right person leading worship didn't right. have, but I had written like a really serious reflection about reflecting on mortality that i was i was doing right after. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. was well and reflecting on mortality right is is reflecting on imperfection right you know and and it's okay yeah. It's all okay. And we all have a learning curve. I mean, the idea that I, as a purple haired, fat community minister, was going to do a bunch of my ministry on video terrified me. Mm -hmm. I was uh, terrified that people wouldn't hear me, that people would judge me in ways that would keep them from hearing me. Um, it has gone beautifully. Yeah. You know, we have made many ceremonies and um, my folks from Stone Circle Wicca, from my, my other spiritual home, uh, recently had initiations. Um, which are for us, excuse me, there are three of them um, over time, or there can be. And this was a first degree initiation. So people who were taking their first step to become full members of the community. And friends of mine who were making the ceremony with me for our new initiates were like, 
yeah, it's too bad. They have to have it over Zoom. You know, it would be so much better if it were in person. But we have students in Oregon. We have students in Maryland. And we have students in Virginia. Mm -hmm. This event meant that they were all together mm -hmm. sharing an experience that none of them will have ever again. Mm -hmm. And that the people who were doing the work of the initiation, the, what, what we were offering for them, also had an experience together that we will never have ever again. Right. And there were bumps, right? There were mute, unmute bumps. And, and they all improved with practice. Yeah. So one of one of the most um, visible parts of the Way of the Rivers uh, community ministry on on Facebook uh, is the practice of beloved selfies. Yes. I wonder if you might talk a little bit about how that how that came about and and what that's meant to the community since it started. Yeah. Um, every Monday. Well, no, that's not where I should start. Beloved selfies do happen every Monday. But the Reverend Teresa Soto took a class at Meadville Lombard in which they learned about selfies as a means for seeing the blessedness in oneself, right? Not some kind of solipsistic, um, narcissistic thing that folks always accuse millennials and Gen Xers, or Gen, not Gen Xers, no, not us, um, Gen Z as Y and Z. Um, you know, a meaningless right. activity. But beloved selfies became a way of saying, where are we folks? Let's share our faces together um, so that we can be with one another and share where we are, what we're doing and how we look. Mm -hmm. Like how, how does, how has this day affected me so far? Mm -hmm. How have I, um, how am I coming to this day? How is it with my soul? Like sometimes I ask that question um, in Beloved Selfies. And the point is that we are all blessed and blessing creatures. That is our nature as human beings. And the practice of Beloved Selfies every Monday is an invitation to lean into that reality as a spiritual practice and some people do it every 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 monday hi mom um my mother lives in italy she's always on beloved selfies um and some people do it occasionally hi oscar uh, and um it's just a time to come together as we are and often to pray for one another mm -hmm. yep Yeah, it's it's an unusual. Uh, no, it's not unusual. It feels like a, a re remarkably deep piece of of Facebook, frankly. Yeah, where people are authentically saying, you know, here's here's where I am this morning, and here's what's been going on from, in my life, and I would I would appreciate it if you would pray for me. Mm -hmm. That's that's a level of vulnerability that takes some some effort to get to yeah and part of what the way of the river means to me is that is being a refuge mm -hmm. being a refuge another word we might use is sanctuary but um being a place that is safe being a place where I show up authentically with my bedhead occasionally on uh, coffee time and a place 
where we are all recognized as blessed and blessing. Mm -hmm. And people don't have that. We're caught up in our, I mean, one of the great things about having the way of the river, one of the gifts to me as a minister is that I get to make it up mm -hmm. in with my community. And I think that's true of many of our ministries, but we don't always see it that way, right? We don't always see it as this constantly creative, co-creative activity. Right, right. Often it's, okay, I've got a budget meeting today. <laughs> right, right. Yep. I have to balance my books, but I don't have a budget meeting with anyone but myself. <laughs> which for better or worse right now <laughs> right. right where is that 24 cents i can't find it <laughs> reconciling it's a beautiful thing i yeah i have to say i've i have been i have been thoroughly routed by by midwestern pragmatism in the last three years because I definitely had a moment when I came in where I, I could not understand the 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 deep. I'm going to use this word, but not in a political sense. The deep financial conservatism of of folks out here. Uh huh. That you know, one of the proudest parts of this congregation's life together. Uh, is that they did this renovation five years ago and and did not borrow money from a bank to do it. Oh, that's beautiful. They borrowed some money from each other, but then they paid that back in three years. Yeah. In, I'm sorry, <laughs> in what? In three years. Yeah, see, uh, that's beautiful. And and I think when I, when I first came, I, I thought that maybe this had been, this is beautiful. And, oh... Uh, you know, I, I want to open things up a little bit, but but given the circumstances, I've been just thoroughly proven wrong. Because <laughs> wrong, wrong, how? Well, because the the argument to 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 be careful and conserve and assume the worst case, we are we are living the worst. Uh... Case. And so, right now in this moment, our 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 budget committee meetings are you know, rough, because we're in a rough place in the world. Um, but but uh, that particular piece of the congregation's personality um, has really put us in a, in a stable position to, to continue doing the work mm -hmm. of ministry. Um, yeah. And so it's, well, it's, an administration of all kinds in the service of the mission of a congregation yep. is ministry. Yeah. And it's something that we don't always acknowledge or see, yes. which I, I would like to, before I know we, we don't have that much longer, but before we go, there's something I'd like to tell folks. Absolutely. We're watching if that's okay. I'm thinking because you brought this up of the spiritual gift of discernment, mm -hmm. knowing how to make a right and solid and reliable choice. Yes. And it sounds like your folks are very committed <laughs> to a process of discernment. Yep. Discernment and formal methods of coming to a good choice have been um, an interest of mine for many years, but particularly since I studied with the Sisters of St. Joseph back in the late 90s and early aughts. Um, and now I teach a class called Making Hard Choices, which is what it sounds like. Um, it's called Making Hard Choices, The Art of Discernment is its full name. And I will be offering it in August, but information about it will appear on the Way of the River very soon in May. And it's eight weeks long um, and is in internet land, a total steal financially, speaking of fiscal conservatism. Um, I have a pay from the heart uh, offering where folks can pay in three tiers, um, where if you feel like 
eight weeks is a total steal at $180. That's what I invite you to pay. If you feel like um, you want to sustain my work and $140 is manageable for you, that's fine. And I particularly encourage people of color, black and indigenous and other people of color, members of the LGBTQIA community, single moms and dads and others, other parents, um, and other folks who just feel the need to pay $100 for eight weeks of uh, material and poetry and um, learning about how to make a good, solid, right choice for themselves. So that'll be on the way of the river.com. And you can also go there to my link, Love Letters, oh. and receive the reflections that Oscar mentioned earlier in our conversation. Don't forget the the, by the way. It's always the way of the, the river. way of the river. The way of the river, because I think somebody else has way of the river. Darn it. Um, <laughs> and if we were if we were looking for the way of the river on Facebook, where would we find it? It is the way of the river community group. And there's a page and a group, which Facebook makes a whole tamasha about. Yes, so you want the group. And I would love to see members of your congregation there and um, and to see you on a beloved selfie very soon. Yes, I need to, um, I need to do that. You can always do it later in the week. It's okay. Yeah. There's no, you know, being marked, <laughs> lowering your grade. I don't know. Three quarters of the, of the selfies I take are, are now just this shot. Like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. Awesome. It's what you're doing. It's part of your blessing and blessedness. I know. When I when I go back into the office, which will eventually happen, I think I'm just going to have a Zoom background set up of of this room. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> changed. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for asking me. No. This is such a delight. I think I think one of the places I want to end is um, is that my congregation might remember um, that. When I was ordained, you did the oh, yeah. charge to the minister. I did. And, and the last admonition you gave me was to, to remember that I have colleagues mm. and to reach out and, and not do this alone. Our work is too important to do it alone. It is. It is. And, and so I just want to... Thank you for reminding me of that so many times and in that really important time and, and for continuing to be in a relationship 10 years, 10 years later. I'm not getting teary. You're getting teary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this has been the Reverend Oscar Sinclair and Reverend Catherine Clarenbach um, for the Unitarian Church of Lincoln and the Way of the River. Lovely. Have a wonderful day, folks.